Hello, I'm Richard Vobes, the Bald Explorer, and today I'm going to tell you the tale of the cursed Italian paintings. This is from Tales of Old Sussex by Philip Mercer, published in 1834. The story is set in 1782, near Heathfield in East Sussex, and there's a funeral. Lady Marlborough is dead. Lady Marlborough had been playing with her grandchildren on the estate beside the lake. The children had these boats, models of ships which they wanted to float on the lake, and one of them had strayed quite far. Lady Marlborough decided rather than get one of her servants to row out and collect the boat, she would do this herself. And she managed to get to the centre of the lake where, reaching for the model ship, she fell, toppled and landed in the lake. Now, she wasn't a particularly good swimmer and she panicked. And before any of the members of staff could get to her, unfortunately, she had swallowed too much water and she drowned. Heathfield and many of the residents, particularly the landed gentry, came out to pay their respects at the funeral. And Lord Marlborough opened his doors in his grand house and let people come in to pay their respects. One of those that attended was Daniel Longstone. He was a tanner and a leather merchant. He sold leather from cow hides in London abroad, but he lived locally in Heathfield and he attended to pay his respects and came into the Grand Hall. And there on an easel was this particular and rather singular painting, a painting of Lady Marlborough. There was something about this painting that drew Daniel Longstone to it. It was the clarity of the artwork. There was a, a certain vibrancy. There was almost an ethereal quality and the likeness to Lady Marlborough that came from this painting seemed incredible. What made the painting all the more poignant was that Lady Marlborough had been depicted in the grounds of their estate with the very lake that she drowned in, in the background. After the wake was over, Daniel spoke to Lord Marlborough and asked him who was the artist of this painting, for there was no mark. And Lord Marlborough told him that it was an Italian immigrant who had come over from Sorrento on the southwesterly part of Italy and had set up a studio close to Heathfield. Daniel was aware that he had a 25 year wedding anniversary coming up and thought that it would be a wonderful thing to have his wife painted by this artist. And he set out for Heathfield that very afternoon to see if he could commission such a painting. The artist, Marco Lombardi, opened his doors and was very enthusiastic about helping Daniel Longstone out with the painting of his wife. But he said, you know, I, but I am very busy. I have a lot of commissions. At the moment, I am in the middle of a commission, but, but, but uh, you know, uh, when I have finished this, I can come and uh, do yours. An agreement was made and Daniel looked forward to having the artist come to his house and his wife painted. Time passed and then there was another tragedy in the locality. The Hatchingham estate had caught fire. It was a terrible thing. Lucy Hatchingham, the wife of Robert Hatchingham, another big wig in the area, had been caught in the blaze. She had succumbed first to smoke inhalation where she collapsed and then finally to the fire itself. It was an awful tragedy for Lucy was in her early thirties and it was too young to die. Again, another funeral took place and then a wake thereafter. And Daniel, who knew the family through business, went along with uh, many of the others. And there he saw, yet again, another of these incredible paintings. It wasn't as large or as grand as the Marlborough portrait, but this one of Lucy Hatchingham seemed even more vibrant, even more alive, even more magical. Again, it struck Daniel the poignancy that this painting actually had depicted Lucy Hatchingham in the very part of the building that had caught fire with her set beside the flaming hearth. 
The 25th anniversary of Daniel Longstone and to his wife was fast approaching and Lucy's painting had inspired Daniel to again visit Marco Lombardi's studio. Lombardi again welcomed him with open arms and said yes he hadn't forgotten and he would do it. He was finishing off one more painting and then he would be free to paint Daniel's wife. But before that happened there was yet another tragedy. The wife of a local farmer who had done well had suffered the mauling from one of her own dogs. For some reason this dog which was later claimed to be a rude breed, had attacked her in a moment of madness. Although she survived for a while, she had an infection and then later died. Daniel again knew the family, for he had purchased many of the cattle for their hides for his tanning business. So he paid a private visit to the family, for they weren't as ostentatious as the other families who'd had similar tragedies and their wakes had been much smaller affairs. He found it incredible that there was yet another of Lombardi's paintings. Although not marked and not signed, he would recognise the vibrancy, the, the brush strokes, the clarity, that magical quality that made the portrait come alive. It was of Margaret Dickens. He frowned as he stared at it. For this painting had Margaret depicted with her dogs and in particular the very dog that had mauled her to death. Daniel was perturbed. On his way home he couldn't help thinking about the two other previous paintings. Lady Marlborough, painted with a lake in the background, had drowned. Lucy Hatchingham was depicted in the east side of the manor beside the fire and had burned to death. And now Margaret Dickens, painted with her dog, had been mauled. Daniel came to the only conclusion that these paintings from this Italian artist were somehow cursed and he became resolute that on no account would his wife be painted by this strange Italian artist. When he explained this to his wife she was reluctant to believe him. She thought this was purely coincidence and nonsense but he laid down the law you will not be painted by him. I will come up with another wonderful gift for our 25th anniversary. But Rebecca, his wife, begged him a little more. It can't be all bad. Lady Sanderson is going to be painted by this artist. It is the fashion. Everybody wants him to paint her. The brush strokes are amazing. The picture, the quality, the magic. You've said it yourself. But Daniel put his foot down and reluctantly Rebecca agreed that on this they would pass. Life went back to normal for a while and Daniel had a few issues with his business up in London exporting these tanned hides across the seas. He would often go up to London and stay for a week or possibly more and then return home. And one such occasion when returning and as usual setting off early so that he could get home by roughly midday he found his wife not in attendance. He spoke to his maid. Where is Rebecca? Oh, uh, she is with Lady Sanderson. Oh, th that is good, he thought, and returned to the heavy state of affairs of his business. But there was something niggling away at his mind and he couldn't work terribly hard and for an hour or so he gave up and he dropped his pen and he remembered. Wasn't Lady Sanderson going to have a portrait painted by this strange Italian artist. Maybe he thought I should just call in at Lord Sanderson's stately manor just to, to make sure everything is all right. He saddled up and he rode the five miles to the Sanderson's estate, a large stone stately manor. He was welcomed of course by Lord Sanderson who he knew but not very well. He was offered brandy and they got chatting. Lord Sanderson said, oh yes, the Italian artist is here. He is in the turret with my wife. Uh, your wife is there too. Daniel started to get perplexed for he had given strict instructions that his wife was not to be painted by this man. Lord Sanderson reassured him, no, 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 of course, it's just my wife to be painted. I have commissioned a very large painting to go over the fireplace. He pointed to where it was going to go and it would be a grand picture once it is finished. Look here, 
said Lord Sanderson, some preliminary sketches that the artist has already made. And he took him to the drawing room where, on the large table, were scattered a number of these pencil drawings. Daniel started to relax as he looked at the drawings of Lady Sanderson, depicted in a ball gown, looking very lovely in the turret room. And then there was one other sheath of paper, a stray picture that he looked at, very quickly sketched, not clear immediately who it was, but it was obvious that it wasn't Lady Sanderson. And as he studied this picture more and more, he realised the likeness of that of his wife. Becoming very worried now, he made his excuses. He stepped out into the hallway. There he saw the archway through to the spiral staircase that took you up to the turret room. Beads of perspiration had broken out on his forehead. His breath was short and he raced up the spiral staircase until eventually he reached the closed door. He wasted no time knocking or calling out for permission to enter, but burst through into the room, panicky that his wife was all right. And there he met a strange tableau, for indeed Lady Sanderson was standing in the middle of the turret room in her beautiful sequined ball gown, looking incredibly radiant and lovely, and behind the easel sat this strange Italian with paintbrush in hand. But they were not looking at Daniel as he had burst into the room, but across the room to the window seat. But it was the horror on their faces that made Daniel turn in their direction. And there, at the window seat, he saw the last moments of Rebecca, his wife, falling through, for the shock of him bursting into the room had sent her backwards. She'd lost her balance and now was falling. The scream was horrifying as she disappeared out of view. All three rushed to the window to look and there was a terrible crunch as Rebecca's body hit the gravel path 35 feet below. Daniel recoiled in anguish and raced back down the spiral staircase and rushed out onto the drive and looking down at her limp body, he realised that if he hadn't have burst into that room, his darling wife would still be alive. Well, that's another of the amazing stories in Tales of Old Sussex by Philip Mercer, and I hope you enjoyed it. And I will find some more from this rather unique and incredible book to tell you in the future. In the meantime, if you have enjoyed it, don't forget to follow, like and subscribe. You could become a patron and help me record more of these stories and more of my explorations when I go out and about. But in the meantime, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you on the next one. Bye for now.